Hey, Sean, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Um, thr thrilled to be here with you today. Oh, good. I'm happy to have you on. You've got a, a, a great story. I'm excited to get into that, and we will shortly. But before we do that, I really want to pepper you with some lightning round, get to know you questions, and then we'll go a little bit deeper into what you do now. Sound like a good plan? Sounds good. Shoot. All right. Where did you grow up and where do you live now? Uh, so I grew up on uh, Vancouver Island, British Columbia. So as far west in Canada as you can go. And uh, I live in Davidson, North Carolina. What's a 2020 goal you're working on that you feel comfortable sharing? Um, I'm restoring an old grist mill that was built in the 1800s and I'm trying to turn it into a, like a simplicity retreat. So that's, uh, and it's a train wreck. So that, uh, <laughs> it's the 2020 goal could be the 21, 22 and 23 goal. I like that. Uh, favorite hobby or pastime? Um, I'm an avid reader, but I'm, uh, I love hiking. Like I, when I get out in, in the mountains and stuff, it just, uh, lights my soul on fire. So like one of my favorite places on earth is Yosemite national park. Mm. Um, yeah, if, if I'm in the mountains, I'm in a good spot. Uh, favorite type of music? Do you like listen to music? I do. Uh, and just about everything. You know, North Carolina kind of puts you in the heart of, uh, so I listen to a lot of country music. I love like, uh, like outlaw country music, Sturgill Simpson, um, Jason Isabel, guys like that. Cool. The, who's had the biggest impact on you growing up, Sean? Um, I would have to say my dad. You know, my dad was, um, uh, you know, by a lot of standards, everyone would look outwardly and think he's just an ordinary guy. But like, he is, um, his kindness and perseverance defined. And, um, you know, just I had so many wonderful examples growing up as a kid that, uh, you know, your dad, for a lot of people, that's the default answer. But like mine, um, yeah, he was very, you know, and my mom too, you know, they were just, my parents were very instrumental in, in how... I became to be what I, what I am, excuse me. Mm. Um, how would you define success? You know, I've had a, a couple different definitions throughout my career, throughout my life. Mm -hmm. And I think I finally landed on one that I've stuck with. And um, because I can't think of anything better, I'll, I'll paraphrase Maya Angelou. And, and she said that success is loving what you do, loving how you do it, and loving who you are while you do it. That's and, really good. Um, you know, I just, I can't do better than that. And uh, <laughs> I used to think, I was from a small logging town, so I used to think it was getting out of town. And then yeah. when I got to Dartmouth, I, I thought it was money. And then, you know, once you start shifting through and sifting through some of the, the, the lies and the myths, I, I just, um, I land on that every time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just, I think it's great. That's really good. And I, the, the journey for a lot of people and a lot of answers to that question has been, it's ev my, my definition has evolved over the years and over time. And so I appreciate the, the response there. That was good. Last question on the quick ones here. Uh, what does a fulfilling life look like to you? A fulfilling for me, it's, uh, you know, again, to leave the world a better place. Uh, personally, to to move through a hundred percent of my failures um, will be a fulfilling life for me. Yeah, you know, that's good. Not get stuck in, in uh, you know a, a stopping place that it would put a lot of other people. But um, yeah, I'd say to move through a hundred percent of my failures would be a fulfilling life. Cool. All right, let's dive into a little bit more of what you do now. And because it's it's so fascinating to me, maybe because it's uh, I don't know anything about it. But I'd love for you to just uh, share the work that you do now, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll take our listeners to a journey on how you got to what you're doing. So how would you explain what it is you do now? So I'm, I'm one of seven in the country, and uh, I am a NASCAR pit crew coach. Um, you know, laughingly, when we go out and talk, like I, I tell people, I run the Department of Unrealistic Expectations for Chicken Nasty <laughs> Racing. But it is my job to train five guys to change four tires and put two cans of fuel in a race car in 12 seconds. Mm. And, and, and if you to, to, to give your listeners an idea, what, you know, what that's about, um, you have one gas guy who has to take a 95 pound can of fuel and plug it into a race car in under 0.8 seconds. 
you have a tire carrier that has to carry two 65 pound tires and deliver them to the right side of the car and have it mounted on the rim in under 0.8 seconds. You have a jack man car with one stroke of the jack and you have two tire changers and they have to hit five lug nuts in under a second. Now, if you think about that, that's two tenths of a second per lug nut, right? So if you go ahead and blink your eyes, that's about two tenths of a second. In our world, the cars on the track are moving at 190 feet per second, mm -hmm. okay? So two tenths of a second equates to about 56 feet. Now, okay. if you look at the Daytona 500, the difference in 56 feet is the difference between first and sixth. And the difference in prize money is about $1.1 million. Wow. Well, so there's that much riding on two tenths of a second in our business. Hence the reason why we say we run the department of unrealistic expectations. Yeah, you know, Sean, I'll be completely honest. I don't even know if I could change one tire in my car in, in under 45 minutes. So <laughs> to hear you just talk about this is absolutely incredible. So we are going to come back to that, but what I, what, like I said, I want to take the listener through a journey on how you got to where you are now. And let's maybe, I just want to give you the chance to have the mic here and talk about your journey. Maybe let's pick it up from whenever formal education stopped for you until you got to what you're doing now. Walk us through that journey because it's such a fascinating, if you're one in seven people, how did doing this job, how did you get there? Right. So again, from Western Canada, came to the States, uh, played college hockey at Dartmouth, um, was lucky enough to make it um, to the AAA level of hockey, played in the American League for the Wilkes-Barre, Scranton Penguins. Um, I was the only undrafted guy there and um, Pittsburgh ended up making a trade and I didn't even need to be told who was going down. It was, it was me. So when I was sent down, um, I was sent to Greensboro, North Carolina. And, um, you know, it was a demotion uh, coupled with some other things. And I was in a big opening night brawl, um, which at the time it was characterized as the worst brawl in the history of the East Coast. Um, not something my parents are super proud of, yeah. obviously. But, Put uh, it on your resume. Yeah, exactly. So when I was sitting in the stands, I met, um, I met a guy in NASCAR and, and I, we just started talking and I said, look, my dad is, uh, my dad has a garage on Vancouver Island, British Columbia. And he's like, well, when he comes down here, I'll take him on a tour. Hmm. So fast forward a couple months, uh, my dad comes down and we get to go on a tour of uh, Bill Davis racing. You know, and, and um, back then, it was just mechanics would work on the cars all day, and then they'd put the race cars. And it was before athletes started doing it. And um, so, you know, we're getting toured around, and we're watching pit practice, and it's not going well. And the crew chief says, you know, get the hockey player in here. And mm -hmm. I was, I mean, I was wearing jeans and something else, and I was like, you know, I, I was like, no, no, no. And, and he was insistent, so I went. And uh, when I went, I was about as quick as the guy who'd done it for five years. Wow. I wasn't a freak athlete or anything like that. I was just, I had some athleticism. So they, you know, they're like, oh, you should do this. And I thought they were joking around. Um, so I went and played the next year in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I got a phone call out of the blue and they're like, no, we seriously want you to try this. And I think when I came back to North Carolina, what did it for me was our last road trip I was in Albuquerque, it was over 3,000 miles on a bus, right? It was wow. Albuquerque to Shreveport to Indianapolis to Wichita. And these NASCAR teams, they, they fly all over the country. It's, it's a chartered plane right to the racetrack. And at that moment, I'm like, what, what am I doing? You know what I mean? I knew I was on the downside of a hockey career. Um, you know, and NASCAR to me was just this little kind of niche thing in the southeastern United States, a little redneckish. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, you know what? I'll do it for a year. It'd be fun. It'd be, you know, give me some good stories to tell. And um, and that was 16 years ago. I started out as wow. a Jackman. Um, we won the world championships in 2008, and uh, had an opportunity to coach about six years ago. And it was um, the sport exploded so quickly back in the day that it put people in positions um, that they weren't necessarily uh, qualified for. So coming up under some really great hockey coaches and then coming into NASCAR, I mean, under some of these NASCAR coaches, it was just, I just felt it could be, I run the department with another guy named Mike Metcalf and we, we've been together a long time. 
uh, as teammates, and we just thought it could be done a better way. So mm -hmm. we took it on six years ago and um, have never looked back. <laughs> just, I mean, I have so many questions. So let, let, me, let me ask a couple that come to mind. So when you were younger, was your dream to be a pro hockey player? Was that, was that kind of the, the path that you thought you would be on and you really wanted to be on? Oh, yeah. I thought it was my calling. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, I was uh, obviously wasn't super intelligent because I was a kid who, you know, like never made the rep team until I was, you know, later on in life. Um, never made like all the select teams and all the, um, you know, and, and in, in hindsight, you know, there's the formula of what your calling is, right? It's, it's passion, market, and talent. Mm -hmm. I was super passionate about it. There was a market for great defensemen in the National Hockey League. I had no talent. Yeah. Um, so no, it was, uh, it was to be in the National Hockey League. And I, and I joke with people, I'm like, I spent 20 some years of my life trying to get to the National Hockey League. And I got to NASCAR in like six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Passion, market, talent. I like that. So, you know, a lot of listeners are in the space where they've been thinking about a transition, a 2.0 career, a second half, second act. How do you, knowing what you know and going through what you've gone, what is your encouragement for someone? So maybe your story is a little bit different because yours was more of, you know, I didn't see this hockey career playing out. And quite frankly, it's not what you thought. You didn't really like it. So almost out of necessity, you got out of it. But how would you encourage someone who might be in a similar spot where they're, they've, they've been on this path, they, they thought it was their path and going to be their career and their future, and they're on it, and it's not? I think, you know, I was really fortunate, um, like I said, first of all, having great parents. But, you know, I came from a really blue-collar town, right? And I went to school in the Ivy League at Dartmouth. Mm -hmm. And it's the first time I've ever been around that type of that type of money, right? And and again, like we said at the start of the show, that's what I thought success was. Mm. When I arrived there, and and met all these kids that you know, summer homes on the Cape, and you know, there was just there was an abundance of wealth there, but there was not a richness of life, right? Mm. So I, I I met kids that hadn't spoken to their parents in years. I met like you know, all these kids that outwardly you'd think they have it all made but they were just some of them were inherently unhappy and it lifted the veil on the on the strictly just the money myth to make you happy and so since then all I ever done all I ever did was I made decisions based on what would light me up what would make me the most happy what would what would I laugh the most at and um you know, that's why I went from corporate recruiting at Dartmouth. I went and played in the minors for 350 bucks a week. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Cause I thought, no, this is, this is going to wake me up every morning. And then the NASCAR thing was I'm super, super passionate about that. And, you know, I think what stops a lot of us is failure, right? Is mm -hmm. the thought, Oh man, we, we, we could failure. Um, and, and I look at myself as a failure coach, right? Because we have, my job is like we said, Five guys, four tires, 12 seconds. I understand failure is going to come. So it makes you look at yeah. failure a completely different way. And, um, you know, as long as you don't let failure stop you or define you, it'll be the greatest teacher that come, comes along in your life. And if you're fortunate, it'll come up multiple times because you'll be that much better for it. Mm. Oh, that's good. So, you, so you're looking at this, you made this transition, you made this pivot, but last question, maybe on hockey, how has it maybe informed you and informed how you make decisions? Maybe you briefly touched on it, but how has that time playing professional hockey informed you and, and set you up for what you're doing now? I think, uh, like I said, I think, first of all, it, it, it gave me grit and it gave me resolve. Like mm -hmm. when you make your way through the minors in hockey, um, it's not an easy journey, right? You start bottlenecking with all the guys with talent. And like I said, I didn't have a lot of talent. I just worked really hard. And, um, and I, I was a pretty tough kid, or at least, uh, at least I thought I was, you know what I mean? I, um, you know, we talk about failure. My greatest failure story is uh, I was in Hampton Roads, Virginia, and I, I played my first year pro in Texas had a really good year, but I wanted to make the National Hockey League. So I knew instead of being comfortable, I was in Corpus Christi, Texas, I sought out the toughest coach in hockey to play for in the country. Mm 
Yeah. It was a guy named John Brophy, and he was at Hampton Roads. And so I called them. They really weren't interested, but they gave me an in, invite to camp. So no contract. Yeah. Yet, you can come try out. Yeah. Equivalent of walking on, right? So I go up there. And uh, by far the toughest training camp I've ever been to. You know, three-a-day practices. This guy was, you know, notorious for, like, the toughest of the tough. And uh, so I go through two weeks of training camp, and I make it to the – final two exhibition games, right? And there's 16 returning veterans. So there's only four or five spots available for, for anyone else. So we go up to Richmond, Virginia, and we play the Richmond Renegades. And um, I have a pretty good game. I get in a fight. Um, uh, you, you define having a good game by getting in fights. <laughs> uh, you, you, you remember where I'm from, right? So, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I, was, uh, I think I was plus one as a defense, but I was a stable, <laughs> rough and tumble defense from right. Yeah. But I fought, um, and I fought a really tough guy, and I fought him to a draw, which <laughs> any hockey fighter, if they tell you they fought him to a draw, it means they lost. Okay? <laughs> um, and uh, we lose and get on the bus, and Brophy is furious. Right. So everyone just gets on the bus and is dead silent. So it's three hours, three and a half hours back to Hampton Roads. Um, I played well enough to get to play the next night. So mm -hmm. that was Friday night. This is Saturday night. Same type deal. We play Richmond again, but this time it's at home. We lose like five, three. I'm plus one, couple big hits, you know, didn't, you know, there were no fights in the game at all. So we come off the ice and the 16 returning veterans are all in their suits in the locker room. And all the guys that just played are all, you know, in their stalls in like every locker room. And Brophy comes in and he's bright red. He's furious. And um, he goes, number 20. And, and I was number 20. <laughs> he's looking around and I'm like, oh, I wonder what this is about. Because I'm thinking I just played two pretty good games. Yeah. And he goes, take your effing skates off. <laughs> so I start untying them and still like not sure what's going on. He yeah. takes, he rips them out of my hands throws him in a garbage can in the middle of the room, <laughs> tells me I don't deserve to play hockey. <laughs> and not only that, so I go home that night knowing they're making cuts the next morning. They pull me in. They berate me for like 40 minutes and telling me that, you know, like I'm a, a waste of size and I'm soft. <laughs> and like every, everything you could do to emasculate a man or say, yeah. that's what they told me. <laughs> so I go, uh, I go back to my hotel room and you get put on waivers and I start fielding all these calls from other teams and their coaches are like, yeah, we really like your size, but we know you don't like the, you know, the rough going and you don't, you're soft. <laughs> and so honestly, I was losing my mind. And uh, so I end up going to South Carolina and again, they just buy me a bus ticket. <laughs> They're not flying me anywhere. Yeah. Um, so the last thing I do, I'm like, okay, well I'll grab a newspaper and read it. Cause it's a, it's a pretty long ride. And uh, so I'm calming down and about halfway in the bus ride, I'm like, oh, I'll read the paper. So I pull it open and the front page of the sports section says, there's a headline that says admirals make cuts. And in it, John Brophy says, the biggest disappointment of camp was Dartmouth defenseman, Sean Pete. He came to camp looking like Captain America and he played like Miss America. <laughs> like <laughs> if I could have ripped the bus window out, <laughs> it's just, but you know what it did? It, um, it gave me resolve, you know what I mean? Because I, I had to make reservations for, for what he said. And, and there was a, you know, a moment of introspection. Mm -hmm. um, and I took the moment and then I just, I, I made myself better from it. You know, like one of the things that I wasn't going to let happen to me was someone else stop my vision of where I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. Right. And one thing that we're really big on with my team is that we don't allow our guys to prove people wrong right? We only allow our guys to prove people right. Because if you think about it, when you try to prove people wrong, what are you doing? Like when you get to prove someone wrong, it's usually at a really brilliant moment in your life, right? A promotion or an accomplishment. And you get to the top of the mountain and you're like, okay, yeah, I just proved John Brophy wrong. Well, you just took him to the top of the mountain with you, right? Mm -hmm. You wouldn't take enemies or people you dislike on vacation with you, right? So why would you take them with you to these brilliant moments? Mm. But, but if you prove people right, you know, the people that pour their love into you and their time and their respect, um, you know, then those are the people that are with you at those brilliant moments. And, and it's just, he helped me with that because I was, it was such a, like a, an emotional, like I think I blacked out when he was screaming at me in the dressing room. So I just, I don't, it, there was so much cognitive dissonance because I knew yeah. I was talking, he was telling me I was this and it was, uh, 
really interesting. I still laugh today. So I well, I love that you can take that and laugh at it. And it, it must have just built so much character in also in how you handle criticism. But one quick question: Did you keep the newspaper clipping, the newspaper article? On I did. Your, did I you did. really? <laughs> when I go on the road now and, and I present, I show people. Oh, yeah. And the funny thing is, is, I thought I had outrun it, and yeah. um, he passed away about five years ago. And they did this three-page thing in the Toronto Star, and sure enough, of all his career, right, which spanned over thirty years, uh, the reporter's like, "Yeah, one of the low moments was when uh, he took Dartmouth defenseman Sean Pete called him captain." <laughs> I was like, are you kidding? <laughs> that had to come back up. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's just, um, like I said, it's, um, if you're still around, I would thank him today because it, it served yeah. me more than making the team ever would have. Oh, yeah, that's good. Okay, well, let's, let's transition a bit into the work that you do now. would love to know a little bit more about what that's like, what an average day is like, what is race day like, what do you do? Um, could you share a little bit about the work that you're doing now as a pit crew coach? Absolutely. So, you know, I'll, I'll take you through a, like a, what a week is for us. And, and again, you know, there was a fundamental change in NASCAR about the mid 2000s and, and the cars became so close in competition on the track that they figured out, well, if we can get an advantage in the pits, we could win mm -hmm. some races. And once they got the tooling advanced enough, they realized, wow, we need to get better athletes. Um, so basically this wave of athletes came in and it was guys like myself, like, like decent athletes, you know what I mean? That had some level of success. No talent um, and soft and things like that. Yeah, exactly. Just like, just like, the, <laughs> just like the article. But I, I only say that because the, our, the athletes that are coming in now are next level. Like mm. right now on our roster, we have uh, a linebacker from the Pittsburgh Steelers. We have a kid that led Clemson in tackles. We have an Olympic swimmer. We wow. have, you know, some, some accomplished baseball players. Um, so the athletic acumen of these guys keeps ratcheting up. Like when we got the kid from Clemson, the first time uh, he ran around the car, I looked at the other coach, Mike, and I was like, I don't know if I can coach that. You know what I mean? It was yeah. so like dynamic. Yeah. Um, so instead of working in the shop, like, you know, all the old mechanics used to do, like a Monday we'll come in and we have yoga for an hour. Right. Wow. And we want them to move and shake off the plane night, plane ride from the night before. Um, on that's all I have on Monday. On Tuesday, they come in at eight a.m. Um, we have a skills practice at eight a.m. and then they have film, and then we have um, a position specific workout. And then Wednesday is a, a competition practice, so all four of our teams will line up against each other, and it's a a, a seeding tournament, and and we play for. We play for uh, basically the prestige and, uh, and a belt uh, on Wednesdays. And then that's our hardest workout of the week by far. Thursday we come in. It's very specific to the racetrack we're going to. We practice there. And then we'll play, um, we'll play uh, like a kid's game, like dodgeball or something like that. And then they're off. Um, so, you know, these guys, I mean, they, work, they don't work past noon, Monday to Thursday, and mm -hmm. then they fly to the racetrack Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and fit the race car. So where, where is all that training happening? Is that near your area there in Davidson? It is. It's just, it's in Concord, North Carolina, and, okay. and our race shop is there. All the race shops are in, in a, you could throw a blanket over just about all of them, and they're all in this area. So, which is good and bad, right? Because you got to worry about, you know, other teams taking your guys. And, yeah. You know, yeah. and we, we operate with a budget that um, is significantly smaller than a lot of other teams. So we just had to do it a different way when sure. we built our team. You so, just painted a, a, an absolutely incredible picture of what a work week looks like. So do you need a washed up, almost 40 year old who's got back surgery and shoulder <laughs> surgery and a former <laughs> volleyball club athlete? Because if you do, I know a guy. <laughs> Come on, man. And, and that's just it, right? And when I started, it wasn't like that. You pitted the race car and then you worked on the cars all week. Yeah. And um, so we're always imploring our guys, like, okay, guys, this is, you know, because you're an athlete. So you have a very defined timeline of when you can do this. Mm -hmm. So, But it gives you enough room to get more studies in or start another business or, yeah. you know, work on yourselves. And, and, uh, um, you know, our, a lot of our guys do a really good job with that. So what is the average age and is there, you know, like a, 
once you reach a certain age, it might you might be too old for it. What does that average age look like? The demographic, maybe. And right now we have uh, we we're seventeen to forty two. That's how big our range is. Okay, I can still right? make it. Okay. So, so we have a kid like literally just out of high school, wow. and we have another guy. And the the forty two year old is top three in our fitness testing every year. Wow, he's a freak. He's a freak. Wow. And, um, you know, again. But we do it a different way, right? Because like I said, with our budget, we had to realize, okay, let's, um, you know, like we had to weaponize our culture if we were going to compete against mm-hmm. all these other teams that are paying twice as much. So, you know, the first thing we did is like our number one recruiting criteria is we put nothing above being a world-class human being. Mm-hmm. If you're that, I can teach you to be a pit crew guy. Because if you think about it, pitting race cars isn't like football or hockey where you have to read and react to an offense or defense, right? Like that car comes skidding to a stop and then you have to do the exact same thing every single time, right? Sometimes you do it under tremendous pressure. Sometimes you don't, but it's still the same thing every time. So what happens is, is you find the kids that, you know, that, that, you know, have this, you know, tremendous work ethic and this um, intestinal fortitude and all these things that go into being a, a good picker guy. Um, and those are the kids that we win with. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And, and we're lucky, you know, like, um, like I said, the kid from Clemson, when Dabo Sweeney was about to play, um, uh, who'd they just beat in the national championship game? Oh, God, it, I was hoping you weren't going to ask this. Yeah, no, uh, like, Alabama? No, it was basically Alabama. when he was talking about his program, he brought up three kids. The kid that we have is one of them. Wow. Yeah. And, and you think of how many successful athletes he's had, but he brought this kid up because the kid's, kid's name is Jonathan Willard and, and just an unbelievable human being. And, and that's what we've surrounded ourselves with. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, and, and, and that's why we're successful is, you know, we have a very carefully curated first day experience to, to try to draw some of that out. So we know what we're working with. You know, mm-hmm. so you, you have learned uh, a lot of things and in, in who you recruit, because this is not at all what I would have thought you would recruit for a, a pit crew guy. So you'd look for just a world-class human being, an athlete, a uh, hard worker. What else are some of the things that you're looking for when you're trying to identify a potential pit crew guy? We're looking for the unspoken stuff, right? So like whenever you show up in life, whether it's a job interview um, you know, a first date, you show up as the best version of yourself, right? Mm-hmm. Like the representative. Mm-hmm. What we're looking to do is to shed that, right? So, you know, when we have someone there, we're going to tell them, we, okay, and anyone in the country can come and try out Chip Ganassi race. Like we don't, it's not open to this person. It's, it's anybody. And we say, be there at 8 a.m. on Wednesday, right? Because I told you Wednesday is our hardest day. So mm-hmm. if they show up at 7.30, they get a check mark and move on. If they show up at eight, they're done. Mm. Um, and then they'll watch two and a half hours of practice. And when practice is going on, there's a lot of dirty work, like cleaning tires and grease and yeah. you know, stuff that just you just don't naturally gravitate towards. If that person jumps in there and helps clean up without being prompted to, that's their next check mark and they move on. If they don't, they're gone. Mm. Um, then we go up the hill and we have our toughest workout of the week. Right. And we don't ask you to lift the most weight or jump the highest. We want to see your intestinal fortitude. It's Stay a with tough it. workout, right? Yeah. We had one kid that um, he started in on and about three quarters of the way he left and threw up, right? Like it's that tough. Yeah. And um, he came back and finished and he, and he was pretty, you know, pretty crestfallen because he thought, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. We loved it because he showed that, you know, he was going to, and, and he's still on our team today, you know? Wow. Um, at the end of that workout, we have 26 alpha males, right? Like I said, we've had Navy SEALs, we've had NFLers and, and think about being on campus for three hours and I'll just come up to you at the end of your workout when you're exhausted and I'll be like, Hey, break the group up for me, please. So now you have to call together 26 guys, hands in the middle, say something that inspires them uh, like that, right? Like that's not an easy thing to do, Yeah. but it shows us, it gives us another glimpse, right? Um, if that goes well, we send them to lunch with four of our veteran guys. They'll vet them over lunch. And then if, if, if they sign off on them, he'll sit down with us and he'll uh, answer a seven page questionnaire. And, and the questionnaire doesn't ask him his GPA or where he went to school. It asks him things like, um, you know, tell me something you failed at. Mm. Uh, tell me something that you believe in that no one agrees with you on. 
Mm-hmm. Um, some questions that, you know, you're, you're, um, you have some history of Dave Ramsey. One of, one of my favorite yep. Dave Ramsey quotes is, even a donkey can look like a thoroughbred for the first two interviews, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we're trying to figure out if this guy's a donkey or a thoroughbred. Yeah. You know, and, and a lot of it is, um, you know, like I said, that unscripted stuff. You, you can tell a lot about people um, just in how they, they look at situations and how they're willing to jump in, you know? Mm. Um, yeah, I, that, <laughs> at some day, I want you to send me a, a, an example workout of what you guys do on your toughest workout just, just for fun. And I'm going to see if I can... If well, I can do visit that one day, we'll yeah, just- okay. I'll just jump in. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. I love it. That's really cool. Okay. So average day, average week, that's kind of what it looks like. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what two, two questions. Yeah. First one, what do people ask you about what you do that you just wish they wouldn't ask? And then I want you to answer the inverse of that is what is a question people don't really ask you about this type of work that you wish they would ask. You can answer whichever one you want first, sure, but you got to sure. answer both. Yeah. So the question, the, the first question is what do they ask the most that, um, that I, that I'm not fond of is when we, when the, when the car loses spots on pit road, right? Mm-hmm. So if we come in fourth and we go at ninth, yep. right, instantly they're going to be like, well, that was terrible. But one thing that people don't realize is a pit stop is made up of more than just the guys hitting lug nuts, right? Mm-hmm. It's how, how good the driver is at, at getting on and getting off pit road, right? Uh, the second is how much adjustment goes into the car, right? So if we change four tires just about every time, but the true chief can come over the radio and he can say, I need to put rounds in the car, which is basically us mm-hmm. taking a big wrench out there and we have to twist rounds in or out of the race car. Okay. And that takes time, right? Um, where the driver stops the car is really important. So, like, there's all these things that um, go into a good pit stop. So, a lot of times people be like, oh, man, you guys were terrible. You lost two spots. And we could have had a really great stop, but we couldn't control the other parts. Yeah. And it always falls on us. We were, um, we were in Darlington a couple of years ago, and we led just about the entire race. And, and we came in first, and we went out first the entire night. And the caution flies with three laps left. And um, we we missed the left rear by just a tick. Like literally, I think we were two or three tenths off the car that beat us out. Mm -hmm. And we lost the race. Mm -hmm. And like people in a 260 person shop wouldn't even talk to us for months. <laughs> so I, I think it's, I, I would wish a better understanding of everything that goes on yeah. in it. Um, the thing I wish they would ask me more of, um, what our guys do beyond just pitting race cars. Mm. You know, like I am blessed with, um, this is the first group I've ever been able to like build and, and put around me. And, and I am so proud of them just because, First of all, they're the only picker in, in the history of NASCAR that's won our version of the Walter Payton Award. So it's called the Comcast Award. But like our guys, they won it because of their selflessness, right? So they, they volunteer at the Barium Springs Orphanage. Um, they cleaned out the Christian mission. They do this toy drive every Christmas at Ronald McDonald House. And they needed a few bikes. The guy showed up with like 70 kids' bikes. Um, we do meals on wheels, which is under review right now because we get speeding tickets every time we do it because <laughs> they, they load Obviously. the people up and then it becomes like a cannonball run to see who could get, <laughs> who could get people's meals to them. So, um, but you know, we show up to these events and the way our guys make, um, you know, whether it's the kids they're playing with or the adults are helping, um, the way they make them feel, I always thought my proudest moment would be us beating another team off pit road, winning the race. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not, it's seeing our guys in the way, you know, getting a letter from a fan from, you know, because of one of our guys went out of their way to, you know, to make their son's day. I mean, um, I think that's the thing that I, I I was really kind of surprised by, you know, after it's all shaken out here. Oh man, that's really cool. Good answer. So, um, one more pivot now because you've, you've taken all the things you've learned here, coaching, uh, guys in the pit crew and you've, 
you've been doing leadership consulting, right? So you're taking what you're learning in this setting, in this environment, and you're applying it to others in different environments. And can you talk a little bit about that, what the work you guys have been doing? Because you have a partner, I think you mentioned his name earlier. Um, some of the work that you've been doing with that, because that is, I think that's really exciting as well. Yeah, so there's, you know, there's a lot of corporate speak nowadays about how people want their team to operate like a pit crew. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and what we found was there was a miss there because people thought it was just a systems thing, you know, and, and it's, it's, there's much more to it than that. And, you know, when you look at the speed of business, right, like even uh, like Rupert Murdoch recently came out and said, um, it's no longer big business versus small business. It's fast versus slow. Mm. Right. And, and, and we, you think of a NASCAR pit crew, they are at the pinnacle of speed in this country. Um, so it kind of started with an opportunity to speak at the NFL combine a couple of years ago. And um, it was in Indianapolis, right? And, and our company has a big presence there. They've won a bunch of Indy 500s. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they asked us if we'd go speak. And I think we've been doing it for so long, you know, being pit crew coaches that you don't really think you have anything to share with the world. Um, so we go up there. One of the more entertaining stories was two days before the conference, we get a list of all the speakers for three days. And every single speaker has like a battery of consonants under their name, right? So it's MD, PhD, whatever, <laughs> except for two. And it was the two, it was Mike and I. We're the only two that didn't have them. So we got the, the thing and we're freaking out a little bit. And then I'm like, you know what? Let's just make our own up. So we went up there and my opening slide said Sean Pete. It said CC, which was Canadian citizen, <laughs> FHP, which was failed hockey player, and, and GSO, which was Miss, a German Shepherd owner. Miss America. It's got to be somewhere in there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but um, what was interesting was, you know, that broke the ice and then we, we had a really good time with it. But when we were done, about 30, about 30 guys stuck around and, mm. uh, we're asking us some really well-intentioned questions. And um, it led to an invite to a couple different teams, National Football League teams. And we're leaving the conference hall and this guy tracks us down. And he said, you know what guys, I learned more in your 30 minutes than I have the first two days of this conference. Mm. And we get into this really great talk. And at the end of it, I was like, oh, well, who are you with? And he's like, I'm with the New England Patriots. <laughs> and, and I should have been downloading him, right? Yeah. Uh, but it just made us think that maybe, maybe we do have a message. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so what we did is we, you know, we built this event where we, you know, we, we can do a keynote, but we can also, we'll bring the race car right to the parking lot of your business or your group. And um, we'll teach you what goes into being a, uh, making a high functioning team, like a mm -hmm. pit crew. And, and a lot of it is, like I said, it's not just a systems thing. It's, truly caring about your guys and your people and your, you know what I mean? And it's, if you want to build speed in an organization, it has to start with trust, right? Trust is the biggest purveyor of speed. And, and so you're doing a lot of things, not trust falls, but you're doing things that are involved in a pit stop where you're going to have to trust other people. And, and, and there's these amazing things that have happened in the course of NASCAR that directly relate to business, you know, pit stops, pit stops used to be in excess of a minute right? The fastest one ever run is 9.96 seconds now. Wow. And, but there was a massive, there were big chunks of time where people started realizing, oh, if you do this, we can pick up four seconds. Or if you do this, we mm -hmm. can pick up two seconds. And one of it was when it was very simple. You know, you have your tire changers who just changed tires. You had your jack man who just jacked the race car. Well, the jack man would jack the race car and then he'd have nothing to do. Mm. Well, one one day, one of them decided, well, I'm just going to reach in there and pull the tire out, even though that's not my job. It'll make us faster, right? Mm. And it's a perfect example in companies, right? That so many companies struggle with like cross departmental collaborations. And it's a perfect example of how when they did this, the whole thing got better. You know, we talk about all the time, you know, rising tide lifts all ships, mm -hmm. right? And we got to figure that out in organizations that, you know, it, it's there's so much. Um, we're so intently focused on ourselves and our journey that a lot of times we lose the group the dynamic. We don't understand it as much, mm -hmm. you know, and, and our company's big mission is, is you can only inspire human brilliance, right? You can't mandate it, especially with the new, the millennials that are coming through it's purpose over purse strings. And, and we implore companies to do it better, you know, like, and we've learned that from our own culture, 
you know, because like I said, we don't have the payroll that other teams have. So we have to do it better. We have to care more. Um, every single guy on our team, we know their birthday. We know their wife's birthday. We know their anniversaries. We know, and I have 26 guys, mm-hmm. right? But when I walk out to practice and they're warming up, if it's someone's dad's birthday, I'll just put my hand on my, on his shoulder and be like, Hey, don't forget to call your dad's birthday. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's free. And it goes a million miles. Mm. Right. Like we, Mike actually saved one of our guys one time. Um, he was out back hanging tires and it was getting late in the day. And Mike goes back there. And he's like, Hey, what are you doing here? And he's like, Oh, I'm just trying to get a couple, you know, extra reps in here before I leave. And Mike's like, no, you got to go now. It's your anniversary. And, and this, <laughs> and this guy's wife is nicknamed the warden. Right. So not a lady. <laughs> and, uh, so he's like, no, it's not. It's wait. Oh shoot. Like he, he, he just totally blew it. Right. And, and Mike saved him in this instant. And, and what it did though, was it showed him that we had his back, right? Mm-hmm. Like we asked a lot of our guys, the, the very least that we can do is show up for them and, and make sure that they're present for their, you know, their really important things in life, you know, yeah. um, calling guys after work to thank them. You know, there's, there's a profound impact on people when you call them outside of work hours, because you don't have to be doing that. Mm-hmm. But what it, it puts them in the crosshairs of your thought and then it makes them feel valued, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's one of the things that in this, this singular approach we're taking to like, I got to get there. I got to get the office with the window. We're missing that. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and, and so it's got to be inspired and, and inspiring other people takes time and effort. And, and you know, it, it doesn't always take money. Like those yeah. are two examples right there of just a few things we do in our culture that, um, you know, that, that, that lift the thing up. So if someone is listening and really interested in, um, the work that you're doing with your partner, Mike, high functioning teams, efficiencies, culture, leadership. How do they, how do they get in touch with you? What's, what is that business? What's that name? So the name of our company is DEC Leadership, D-E-C-K. And it's an acronym for diversity, efficiency, culture, and kindness. Hmm. Um, and we believe those are the, the four horsemen of the American workplace right now. And now actually we have a book that's launching. Um, it's called 12 Second Culture. And, and it's basically um, a look inside of how, you know, how we built the pit crew department um, at our team and, and the, the things we employed and what worked well for us and what didn't. And it's a, it's a real honest look into to how we did it, you know, and, and it was, you know, it's leadership for the right reasons, right? Like I think so much of it now is leadership for the wrong reasons, right? Like we said, the race to step over people to get the mm-hmm. corner office. You know, like one of the, it's interesting because with where I went to school, um, I'm proud of my degree and all that. Please don't get me wrong. But at some of our team building events, you know, I have a very spirited discussion a lot of times with C-level people because I think it's a miss when you just hire someone because they went to school in the Ivy League, Mm. right? And you're going to overlook some kid that, uh, you know, worked two jobs to put him through or herself through community college and you're overlooking all the grit and the resolve and the, the things that, you know, could really benefit your company. And, um, I got into it one time with this guy and, you know, his, he was aspiring to be a C, he was just on the cusp of going to C level. And he was asking us, you know, Hey, what do you think? And, uh, I said, well, what is, what does the C and C level stand for? And he said, uh, stands for chief. And I said, exactly. And I said, um, well, how did a young Indian warrior ascend to the position of chief? And he's like, I, I don't know. I've never really given it any thought. And a young Indian warrior, when, when he first started out, all he cared about was the health of the group, right? So how it was clothed, how it was fed, how it was mm-hmm. protected, right? And he dedicated his you know, waking hours to making sure the group was protected. The group was rising up as a whole. His, it, was, it was never his intention to be chief, but because of his actions, he became chief right? Do you know what the number one characteristic of a psychopath is? Oh boy. Profound lack of empathy. Mm. So what sounds, I mean, you've, you had, you've taken a glimpse behind the corporate curtain. What yeah. sounds more accurate? <laughs> you know, chief executive officer or psychopath executive officer? Yeah, the latter. <laughs> right, exactly. And so like this work means a lot to us, yeah. you know, like we want to change it. There's, 
there's more heart attacks on Monday morning in the United States than any other time during the week. Mm. That's because people are so dissatisfied of what they're doing. You know, mm. it lacks purpose and it lacks value. And it's, you know, it, it has nothing to do how, with how hard it is, right? Because as human beings, we're built for the struggle. Mm-hmm. But what we're not built for is not being necessary. Mm. Right? And so many of these companies make us feel like we're just not necessary. Yeah. They, oh, that's... Don't, want, they don't want our gift. They just want our work. Yeah. Um, I will make sure that I link deck leadership and all things that in the show notes so someone can grab that and and follow along. Um, Two last questions that don't have anything to do with anything, but they're fun. Number one, if you had to give a TED talk on something that you're not known for, Sean, what would it be? Uh, That is a great question. Um, I would have to say um, I'd love to give a TED talk on us being, um, I feel like we are way too naive to be so pessimistic about things that don't work out for us. Mm, is what that's I think. interesting. Right. So if you think about, um, uh, you know, there's people, there's, there's countless stories from 9-11 where, you know, people were, you know, pissed off because, you know, they had to wait in line outside the daycare or the barista mm. took too long with their coffee and it mm. ended up saving their life. Mm. Right. I have a, a couple examples from my own life where like I was always wanted to go to the Western hockey league and I was recruited by a hockey coach who ended up being the, the, the equivalent of, of Jim Sandusky from Penn state. Mm. This hockey guy was that in Canada, a monster. Mm. Mm. But for a year I carried it because I couldn't, I, we didn't have the money to me for me to get out there. Um, and I wasted that whole year being so pessimistic that, Oh, you know, uh, life's rough and it doesn't work out for me. You know, we, sometimes we need to surrender to the bigger plan because we waste so much energy saying, Oh, it should have worked out like this. And then when we kind of look back in hindsight, thank goodness it worked out the way it did. That's a good, I, that's a good answer. I like that. Last one. Then what is something you've always wanted to learn, try or do that you just haven't gotten around to yet? Play the guitar. Play the guitar. That is a yeah, that's I, a common one. Oh man, I am such um, I am such a fanboy over like like <laughs> musical talent. Like there's a there's a, a festival here called Merle Fest and it's bluegrass music. And I okay. I literally saw Chris Stapleton play there in front of 14 people. And wow. the second that guy opened his mouth, like you just were like, whoa. Yeah. Um, you know, like uh, and, and just seeing people play the guitar, the mandolin, the violin here, the fiddle in North Carolina. Um, I just have such a profound appreciation for, for that type of talent because I am devoid of all of that. Type of stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. So yeah. I like it. Uh, Sean, I could probably talk to you for hours and, and hear more stories. And I really appreciate you jumping on. What is a, uh, just in closing, what's a really good way that people can follow along with the work that you're doing and all things that you're up to? Yeah, like I said, we're um, deckleadership.com, uh, deck leadership on uh, Instagram. And then uh, if, um, if you want to feel better about yourself, <laughs> uh, Howard's Creek Mill on Instagram, it's, uh, it's that old grist mill we're taking back. Basically, we have someone stop every single day and tell us we're out of our minds for trying to fix it. Um, so if you want to laugh, uh, uh, follow us along there too. Okay, and, that and sounds good. And please contact us if there's anything. We're very passionate about seeing it done a better way. If we can help any of your listeners in any way, reach out to us. Yeah. We work, like I said, we love talking about this stuff. I appreciate that, Sean. It's been a real pleasure getting to know you and getting to chat on here. And I just want to thank you for, for jumping on and, and having a couple of laughs and dropping some good wisdom today. So thanks a lot, Sean. Likewise. Thank you.